Welcome to the Gatter Girls YouTube channel. For those of you who don't know, my name is Taylor. I am a physician assistant and I work in women's health. In today's video, we're going to be breaking down PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. What is it? What is the diagnosis criteria? What are the symptoms, the risk factors associated with it, and how do we treat it? Before we break this down, if you like this content or you find it helpful, be sure to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more informational videos on women's health. Now, I don't really like the name PCOS. You want to know why I don't like it? Because it's kind of confusing. So if we take a look at this photo here, now I'm not an artist, but I think this will get my point across. If we take a look at this ovary here, this represents a normal ovary. You see these tiny little circles in the ovary? Those are what are called follicles. In a normal cycle, we have hormones that tell your uterus in your ovaries to produce these follicles to eventually produce a egg that's going to be released to ovulate. In PCOS, you don't ovulate. If you take a look at this ovary here, you see it's really enlarged, it's swollen, and it has multiple tiny immature follicles. These immature follicles are what we call polycystic. So this is where the name PCOS got its name from. The reason I don't like it though is because these are not actual cysts in your ovaries. If we take a look at this diagram that I drew here, again, normal ovaries represented here. But if you take a look over here, you see this big swollen out pouching? This is actually a simple cyst. This cyst could be fluid filled or it could be filled with this dense mass type of material. These are what we typically think of when someone says I have an ovarian cyst. Very different from this ovary representing PCOS. A simple cyst tends to cause chronic pelvic pain, where PCOS, we're going to get into it a little bit more, tends to cause a lot of other symptoms. So now that we broke the name down and why I don't really like it, what is PCOS? So PCOS affects 1 in 10 women in the United States. It's a dysregulation of our hormones between our progesterone levels, our estrogen, and our testosterone. In order for us to understand that a little bit better, I drew another diagram. We have a lot of diagrams in this video. We take a look here, we have our brain. Our brain releases hormones that get circulated to the uterus and the ovaries. In a normal cycle, it tells your ovaries to produce an egg and to ovulate. Once we ovulate, our body releases a hormone called progesterone. It gets sent back up to the brain to start this cycle over again. Women who have PCOS, this gets all confused. So now we're going to look at the PCOS diagram. Our brain releases this hormone, but you can see it gets lost. It gets super lost and confused. It goes on this weird path. And eventually, by the time it gets to the ovary, it's a really small amount. It's enough to tell the ovaries to start producing these follicles, but not enough to tell your ovary to release an egg or to ovulate. That's why in PCOS, again, we have these multiple immature follicles in this really swollen ovary. This releases enough hormone that goes back to the brain to tell this confusing cycle to start over again. Let's break that down even further. So I have the last diagram of the video. We take a look here. We have a hormone called FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone. That follicle stimulating or hormone goes to the ovary it tells the ovary to produce follicles and to ovulate. In PCOS, we have a really small amount of follicle stimulating hormone. Therefore, not producing enough mature follicles and we're not ovulating. When we don't ovulate, our body does not produce the hormone called progesterone. When we don't produce progesterone, we then increase this hormone called LH. LH stands for luteinizing hormone. What this hormone basically does is it tells your body to produce more estrogen and more testosterone. This is why women who have PCOS tend to have a lot of what we call androgenic side effects, such as weight gain, acne, facial hair growth, thinning hair growth on the top of the head, obesity, different symptoms that are associated with testosterone. This then goes back and further decreases our FSH. So we're further producing immature follicles. Now in order to be diagnosed with PCOS, we go by what's called the Rotterdam criteria. This criteria, in order for diagnosis, you need two of the following three criteria. Number one, irregular or absent periods. 
Number two, either blood levels that show we have high androgenic hormones such as testosterone or symptoms associated with it, such as the weight gain, the acne, the male pattern hair growth, those symptoms that we just talked about. And number three, sonographic evidence that show that swollen ovary with multiple immature follicles. Now, like I said, we only need two of the following three. So you technically don't need an ultrasound to be diagnosed with PCOS. If you see me or in our clinic, we do sonograms on most of our patients as part of the diagnosis criteria, but if you don't have access to a sonogram, you don't need to have it for diagnosis. A common misconception with PCOS is that you also have to be overweight to have PCOS. That's not necessarily true. We have a lot of patients who are at a normal or even underweight who have PCOS. Going back to that criteria, again, we only need two of the three. So those androgenic side effects don't technically have to be part of the criteria for you to be diagnosed. As long as you have irregular periods and sonograms showing that you have multiple immature follicles or PCOS on a sono, you have enough to be diagnosed. Now, it's more common to be overweight. This, we hold on to more fat cells, increasing our risk for obesity. We become insulin resistant, which increases our risk for metabolic syndrome as well as diabetes. When we have diabetes, we're at more of an increased risk of high blood pressure and high cholesterol. So again, a lot of the women are overweight with PCOS, but that does not mean you have to be for criteria. Now, what are the treatment options for PCOS? Now that we've learned what it is and how we diagnose it, how do we manage it? So management definitely comes down to a lot of lifestyle modifications. So PCOS is really driven by inflammation. It's a very inflammatory disease. So we want to do anything that can help to decrease our inflammation within our body. So that means good supplementation. So supplements such as coconut oil can really help to decrease inflammation. CBD oil can help to decrease inflammation. I'm going to really dive into this stuff in more detail in a future video. You want to follow more of an anti-inflammatory diet, so you want to really decrease your sugars and your processed carbs. You want to increase more lean proteins, good healthy fats, fruits, and vegetables. You want to kick those bad habits to the curb, so you want to stop your smoking, stop your vaping, stop the excess drinking. You want to have really good sleep patterns. All of those things can really fuel inflammation, which can fuel the disease of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, getting a little bit more into the medication side effect, again, increased testosterone can increase our risk for insulin resistance as well as metabolic syndrome and diabetes, so metformin plays a big role in the treatment. Metformin is traditionally a diabetic medication that helps to control our insulin and our glucose levels, so this could be really helpful for someone who is following down that path of diabetes or that pre-diabetes path. Another really important treatment is a birth control. Whether that be a birth control pill, an IUD, the shot, any type of birth control that is hormonal. And I'm gonna dive a little bit more at the end of the video into the role and why birth control is so important with PCOS treatment. So some risk factors that are associated with PCOS, the number one risk factor is obviously your symptoms, like I talked about those androgenic symptoms with those weight gain, that hair growth, the acne. Another extremely common risk factor is infertility. So a lot of women have infertility who have PCOS because when we're not ovulating, we're not releasing that egg, that egg can't get fertilized, and then it can't implant and we can't conceive. Now, that does not mean that every woman is gonna struggle with issues with infertility. We have several successful women who have PCOS with right treatment options, lifestyle modifications, and the right monitoring have very successful pregnancies. So I don't want that to alarm you, but that is something that is commonly associated. That is something though that we can treat and help you with. So don't feel like you're struggling alone. If you have any issues, put them in the comments. We can see if we can you know, try to tweak some of your lifestyle modifications and see if we can help you. Now, the last, which is the worst possible outcome, the most dangerous outcome of polycystic ovarian syndrome is endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancer. The reason that this can happen is because when you're not ovulating, you're not releasing a hormone called progesterone. 
We like to call progesterone the protector of the endometrium. So in a normal healthy cycle, when you ovulate, you release the hormone called progesterone. Your body produces that hormone. That hormone is what tells your uterus it's time to have a period. It's time for us to shed that lining and to bleed. If we don't have that, and if we go back to this diagram here, we have low progesterone or no progesterone, and if you see here, we have high testosterone and high estrogen levels. Estrogen is what thickens that lining. So we're gonna thicken, 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 and we don't have that progesterone to offset it to say let's shed or let's have a bleed. Over time, it can get so thick that those cells can start to become irregular and lead to what we call hyperplasia. Hyperplasia can then lead to cancer cells. This is where the role of birth control or progesterone become very important in the treatment of PCOS. We need that endometrial protection. We don't like you to go more than 90 days without getting a bleed or a period if you're not on birth control. If you're on birth control and you're not getting a period, that's okay because your body is still having that progesterone in you. If you have PCOS, we like you to go on a birth control to give you that progesterone every month so you're shedding that lining and getting a period. If you are opposed to birth control, if you have medicational interactions or you have other issues, bleeding, clotting disorders, if you have reasons you can't be on birth control, or if you're obviously trying to get pregnant, that wouldn't be a great option for you. We have progesterone that you can take every 90 days. Now, we always tell you to keep a diary, keep a bleeding log when you have PCOS because your periods can be extremely irregular. We can have a period one month, we can go 60 days and then have a period, we can go 100 days and have a period. We don't want you to cross that 90 day mark without having some type of withdrawal bleeding. If you go more than 90 days, we'll give you 10 days of progesterone, which tells your body again, it's time for a period, it's time to shed that lining. So it sheds that lining and then you can start that cycle over. So it's helping to prevent that thickening of that lining, which again, worst case scenario can turn into cancer. I don't talk about this too scare you. This is not a common outcome. Again, it's just something that is really important in the treatment of PCOS. If you guys found this information useful, again, make sure to like and subscribe so you can be sure to see my future videos. I'm going to dive a little bit more into the lifestyle modifications in my next video that we talked about a little bit mid-video. PCOS is a dysregulation of hormones. It's very common. One out of every 10 women in America suffers from it, but you're not suffering alone. If you have any questions, please drop them in the comments and I'd be sure to help you.